Hey, so today we're going to have a brief introduction on the elements of Greek tragedy. The first thing you need to know is that a tragedy is when a basically good protagonist makes a mistake and his world ends up crumbling before realizing his error. We're going to talk specifically as uh, it relates to the drama Antigone. And Antigone was an ancient Greek play written by a man named Sophocles around the year 440 BC. So let's talk about some objectives for your reading. The first thing you want to be able to do when reading Antigone is to be able to explain the influence of historical context on the form, style, and point of view of the text. Remember, this play was written a long time ago in ancient Greece, and the way people lived back then, their culture and their beliefs, highly influenced the way the play is written and the purpose of the play. I want you to be able to identify some universal themes in Antigone, and that's going to be really important because later on we're probably going to find the same themes in a Shakespeare play and possibly have to compare them, so keep an eye for those universal themes. Of course, we always want to use our reading strategies like making predictions and visualizing and drawing inferences because sometimes the language of these plays is hard and the things they talk about is not um, very well known to you. So the more strategies you use to understand, the better you're going to enjoy the play. And also compare and contrast how the author's use of literary devices conveys a message. We'll always be looking for similes, metaphors, illusion, personification, and all that other great stuff you've been learning about for years. Because this happens a long time ago, analyzing the cultural or social function of literature is also going to be very important. Antigone, like most Greek tragedies, has a religious significance to the ancient Greeks, um, and it portrays a lot of their values. So we can learn a lot about that time period just by reading this play. So let's talk about some conventions of tragedy. Conventions means basically the things that make a tragedy a tragedy. So what we're going to see in ancient Greek tragedy is time that the entire plot of the drama is going to occur in mostly a single day or a day and a night. Place, there's going to be only one main scene. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of you know, scene changes like you might in modern day plays. The Greeks kept it pretty simple. Action. There's one main plot in Antigone, um, and you're not going to see subplots with subcharacters doing other things. There's one main thing going on, so at least that makes it a little easier to understand. Back in ancient Greek drama, there was no violent action off, uh, on stage. So maybe you've seen a Shakespeare play before and you see people doing like pretend sword fights on the stage um, because violence certainly does occur. You know that people die. Uh, for instance, in Romeo and Juliet, people die on stage. Uh, not so much for the ancient Greeks. They kind of allude to violence, but they don't show you it. And that's probably because of the ancient religious significance of these shows. Also, this ancient Greek drama has no actual suspense. Uh, what I mean by that is the audience who went to see these shows already knew before the play even started what was going to happen because all of these plays are based on myths and legends that the Greeks would have been very familiar with and just in case they weren't familiar with them the chorus right at the start of these plays is gonna tell you pretty much what's gonna happen before it does so the point of seeing this play is not to find out what happens in the end because they know the point is uh, to learn from the choices the characters make and then just to enjoy the performance these plays emphasize people ideas and emotions not so much the plot it's the it's the people and the characters and what they learn now there's six parts of a tragedy in ancient Greece of course remember plot most important element there's one main plot characters tragic hero. These tragedies in ancient Greece have a tragic hero. That is the basically good character who is wise and beloved who falls from grace due to some character flaw of his own. There's definitely theme. Theme is a huge part of tragedy. The uh, playwright wants the audience to learn something from watching this show. Diction. There's going to be many uh, literary devices like metaphors used to enhance the play's point and to basically help the audience visualize better what the playwright is talking about. Song is part of ancient Greek chorus. It's, it's, not, um, it's not like singing with music. It's more like chanting. But whenever the chorus speaks in this show, it's, it's actually a song. It's actually chanting. And spectacle, special effects, they're not really as important 
for the ancient Greeks, but, but sometimes you will see this. And notice in the green box, no deus ex machina allowed. That's a Latin word, phrase, meaning God from, from a machine. So basically, um, that means that if the show is going along and then all of a sudden at the end something unexpected happens and the end of the show occurs, that's a deus ex machina. Like, it came out of nowhere, you know. It came out of nowhere and it changed. That's not going to happen in these ancient Greek shows because, again, there's no real suspense. The audience knows what's going to happen. Everything kind of connects and makes sense. So you're not going to get any crazy plot twists coming at you uh, when you watch these shows. So let's see uh, what this really short video clip has to say. The first really important study of Greek tragedy was by a 4th century Greek philosopher called Aristotle. And Aristotle thought for a very, very long time about what made Greek tragedy effective. And he actually came up with a formula, <laughs> and that is that the heroes of tragedy needed to be um, good, but not so good that um, you sort of couldn't relate to them. People trying to be good, but making mistakes, like Creon, he is actually trying to be a good king of Thebes, he's just not getting it right, he's making lots of mistakes. And the good guy who isn't good enough, but he's pretty much like you or me, makes a mistake. It ends in, 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 in some terrible misfortune um, and he goes from a status of being sort of happy and rich and, and, and content to utter misery and utter despair. What Aristotle says this should do to the audience is make them feel incredible pity for the people they're watching which I think we certainly do in Antigone, first for her and then by the end for Creon. Um, and also fear that, oh, if I put a foot wrong, that might happen to me. And it's those two emotions that Aristotle says that tragedy really needs to elicit. All right, so what they were talking about there is, is the tragic hero, mostly. And what the lady was saying was that a tragic hero is worthy and noble, but has some kind of flaw. And normally the flaw is extreme pride or desire, and that's called hubris. The hubris is the tragic hero's hamartia, his character flaw. And that hamartia leads to disaster, as the protagonist tends to break a moral law for the ancient Greeks, a law that goes against um, their mythology and their god's laws. Because the tragic hero has a hamartia and therefore breaks some kind of moral law, retribution occurs for him. It's cosmic payback. And, you know, yes, he suffers because of it. In fact, a catastrophe happens. It changes the hero's fortunes, and he ends up utterly miserable, mostly. And in most of these shows, specifically in ancient Greece, recognition does happen at the end. Um, it's called anagnoresis where the tragic hero in an ancient Greek tragedy realizes what he's done. He learns his moral lesson. He knows he can't go back and he knows he can't fix it. And that kind of helps the audience identify with him and embrace the universal message that he was supposed to learn. But unfortunately for the tragic hero, it's, it's too late. His life's not going to get better. Um, but your life as the audience might now that you've learned. The Greek chorus is hugely important in these ancient Greek plays. Um, they provide entertainment and they kind of set the mood. When the chorus is happy, you know that good things are coming. When the chorus is talking about death, despair, and bad omens, you know that bad stuff's going to happen in the play, so they're kind of neat. Um, they also represent the common people, and they will comment on the events in the show. So if you're not sure how to react to something Antigone says, like you think what she says is okay, well they might come in in the next uh, part of the show and say that she's being prideful and she's being immoral and she's being bad and, and you kinda learn that you might think Antigone's fine but they're telling you the ancient Greeks don't think that's okay, that behavior's not okay. Uh, these guys, this chorus definitely takes sides in the dramatic conflict. They make it very clear who they support, and they tell you why. They warn characters um, of what's to come. So sometimes a character, in this case Creon, he's our tragic hero, well, one of them, he's our tragic hero, and at points the chorus basically warns him you're not you're being too prideful, you're not trusting your advisors, you're closing yourself off to what the people want, you're too full of yourself, but, but Creon ignores them and Creon suffers. So our purpose of tragedy is catharsis. For the ancient Greeks, catharsis was hugely important. This means the purging or cleansing of emotions or learning through suffering. 
Now the tragic hero, he learns through his own suffering, but the audience, you also learn through suffering vicariously along with that hero. Tragedies are supposed to evoke pity and fear in you, the one who watches it. Um, you're supposed to feel anxious as the hero makes poor decisions. Since you already know he's going to make those decisions, you already know that he's going to end up miserable or possibly dead. You know, you kind of feel, even though it's not true suspense, it, it is suspenseful to see how he reacts to the choices he makes. Um, the closure of the tragedy, when recognition occurs for the hero, is supposed to spiritually cleanse the whole audience and so that you don't make the same mistakes that that hero made. So here's some background you need to know for the play before you start. Um, Antigone. Antigone and Ismene, those are sisters. They're the daughters of Oedipus, who is, who is dead at this point. Oedipus was the former king of Thebes, um, and he had been banished for something horrible uh, he had done. If you have read the play Oedipus Rex, which translates to Oedipus the King, you can learn all about uh, the bad thing that Oedipus did. Uh, without knowing, it was fated, so it's not, it's not all his fault, but nevertheless, he did something that brought a curse upon his family, and that's why all of these other people's lives end up so horrible because of their father's poor choice and poor fate. Oedipus also has sons, um, Ateocles and Polynices, and they're brothers of Antigone and Ismene. Those sons, they fight for power um, over Thebes. They, they fight to basically control. There's Polynices and Ateocles. Ateocles stays in Thebes to defend it, uh, whereas Polynices gets an army um, outside of Thebes and basically tries to invade. But they're both trying to vie for power. Just one was in the city, and Polly was outside of the city. In the end, Polynices um, and Ateocles, they're both killed. They both die in battle. And when they both die, well, the only man left to take over is this man named Creon, Oedipus's brother-in-law and uncle. Um, and Creon decides early on that, for whatever reason, because Ateocles was in the city of Thebes defending it, and Polynices was getting like another army outside of Thebes to help attack it, that Polynices must have been a traitor. Polynices is bad. And Creon refuses to give Polynices a proper burial. But he does give a proper burial, burial to Ateocles. Now maybe you don't think that's a big deal because you're not an ancient Greek, but back then they believed that if you were not given a proper burial, that your soul would not move on properly in the afterlife. So Antigone is horrified by Creon's decision not to bury Polynices, and she's going to do some things um, that, you know, she, she's going to get in a little trouble for. But that's kind of the conflict of this play. It's about a burial, that Creon won't bury Polynices, and Antigone wants him to bury Polynices. So there we go. Some textual elements to be aware of in this play, well, there's a prologue, which is the opening scene. Um, there's the parados, which is the first time the chorus will enter and chant about the theme of the play. Usually the chorus elucidates the theme, so listen for that. Episodes are the ancient uh, Greek word for scenes, so instead of saying scene one, scene two, scene three, it's episode one, two, three. Stasimons are choral odes, so it's just another way of saying the choral ode is a stasimon. The strophe and the antistrophe are the two different voices of the chorus. So when the chorus speaks, one half will talk to the other half, and they'll talk in unison. So like six members will say something, and then six members will respond. And that's how they talk to each other, but it's still all the chorus. And the final part of the tragedy is the exodus, usually sung by the chorus as they exit, and that's going to once again point to the theme of the show and what the audience should have learned by uh, seeing what happened to the tragic hero. So if you have any questions, please ask me, and let's enjoy the show by reading it.